Greetings, everyone, from the safe confines of my home office here in Connecticut. I trust that everyone is safe and well. My name is Dennis Hallahan, and I work with Infiltrator Water Technologies. Previously, I worked at consulting firms and was in the same shoes as many of you, designing systems. Now I have been with Infiltrator for over 20 years, and we are fortunate to be able to assist in the design of many systems, big and small. Although we get to do the fun stuff, the actual design work, we work through the permitting, soil studies, coordinating field work, and other relevant data. Some of that may be tedious in dealing with the bureaucracy and paperwork, not much real engineering going on. Well, we get to take all of your data and generate designs and proposals and work through many options. By doing this, we are involved with hundreds of designs, many, many more than a typical consulting firm gets to do each year. So like I said, we get to focus on the fun, the actual engineering part. This project caught my eye and thought that it'd be good to share. There are not many projects we deal with that have long-term data. With this project, we have almost eight years of data collection. And a pack bed filter, of course, is just another name for a sand filter. This project has one, but with some unique differences, which we will review. First of all, let's review uh, decentralized systems. Decentralized systems serve 25% of the US population and approximately 30% of new development. And at last year's New NUIA conference, one of the presenters stated that 80% of all permitted, permitted systems were less than one MGD. Well, this then is a large market and is right up our alley with the small community committee and offering decentralized so solutions. Traditionally, we think of these decentralized systems as what you see on the screen here, a septic tank followed by a drain field. But with the expansion of today's technologies, Whatever technology is available for large systems, those also have been scaled down to treat lesser flows. Today, there are single family MBR treatment systems available. So the decentralized industry has expanded to meet higher treatment standards and higher flow systems. For example, here's a decentralized system with higher flows and treatment. This was a California FEMA base camp. It was the town of Paradise. And you may recall a couple of years ago, the town suffered from some from some terrible fires that blew through there, and it actually burned 14,000 structures to the ground. So a system was constructed for the workers, uh, designed for 100,000 gallons a day, and it includes the kitchen and laundry facilities as well. It is a sand filter system, and all the treated water is captured through a liner and then pumped out to a uh, evaporation pond, which could also be used for reuse. This is one of the four sand filter beds to be installed. This was a very unique project. It's all done fast track, expedited approvals. Hundreds of mobile housing units were set up overnight. Sanitary pipes were just laid on the ground and connected together. And no other conventional wastewater plant type system could have met these timelines. So the decentralized option easily won on the basis of time and cost. And decentralized systems, of course, can treat flows over one MGD. We have a couple projects installed at that capacity. This one's closer to home. You may already be familiar with it. The 1.2 MGD was the design flow plot prior to the Patriot's Place being totally built out now with restaurants and hotels and shops. I'm not sure what that design flow is now, but when the system was first installed, you can see the, the old stadium here, which I went to as a kid, and the new stadium being constructed, and the drain fields were placed below the parking lot. So here we have an H20 system drain field below the parking lots, and of course it's going to be several of these. You can see another one being prepped over here. So all the wastewater from the stadium on uh, game day comes to the storage tank, uh, flow equalization tank in front of the treatment building, and it gets metered through the treatment building, and the stadium also has reuse for toilet flushing. Whatever it does not uh, go to reuse will then go down to the drain fields and uh, recharge the local aquifers. Um, the small communities um, committee is looking at setting up a field trip to tour this facility so please keep in touch with us. We hope to set that up as soon as we're able to travel and things open up. So decentralized systems. The model is very adaptable. Here we have some of the typical markets that can be served. Of course we talked about single family residential. And there's the in-between, I'll call it community systems, whether it be community system of homes or small commercials, such as a school, 
These can be sent, um, uh, addressed with step systems, which is septic tank effluent pumping systems or cluster systems. And then the large commercial like uh, Gillette Stadium we talked about as well. This is the type of system that is installed at Blodge Atlantic, just to give you some background. This is, uh, think of this as an optimized sand filter. This is the single family system, but like most technologies, it is scalable. So in the regulatory world, this is known as a combined treatment and dispersal system. It has gravity flow, so from the house to the septic tank will be gravity, and then gravity flow from the tank to the drain field product. Uh, wastewater then gets treated through the sand layer, and then where it's accepted by native soils underneath the system. So this is gravity, as shown. Uh, it's passive with no energy input, and this system is manufactured in New Hampshire. It's also passed uh, several accredit accredited testing agencies. Here we have the Presby product, just to give you a, a feel of what it is. So it's, it's, it's pretty simple if we break down the parts and pieces. Uh, first of all, it's a 12-inch diameter pipe, and it's surrounded by some random fiber geotextile, and, which is then encased by a geotextile fabric so sand doesn't get into the system. And then there's the, um, the couplers and pieces you need to um, connect the system together. So here we see a single level bed. You can see it, the system scales up nicely to whatever the design flow would be. This could be broken up into smaller beds. Please note the venting system on each end. There'd be a high, a high vent on this end and a low vent on this end. So this is the single bed. And to optimize um, footprint, we can now have a um, kind of a double layer sand filter. Presby calls it the multi-level system. Um, so we can stack it up to reduce the footprint. All right, so let's talk more basically about sand filters and their advantages. They've been studied forever back in the 1970s. It seems like every university in the US studied them. But as we know, they're a very passive system with low energy. They offer advanced treatment. No chemicals are required. Um, they can be um, set up to fit the site. They don't need to be one big one. You could break them up however you wanted to. So they, they fit sites nicely. There's very limited operations and maintenance. It does not require skilled personnel to, to install or operate the system. And the materials are all low, cal, low cost and locally sourced. Now, there are some disadvantages to sand filters. Over the years, some of them have been prone to clogging. They can be land intensive, so it does require a larger footprint. And by that, I mean compared to mechanical treatment plant. You know, ones with, as you increase the energy, you will reduce the footprint. It's pretty well understood. Um, uh, idea in the uh, in the wastewater industry. Um, another disadvantage is cold temperature performance. With uh, colder climates, if it was a surface discharging uh, sand filter, then uh, you know they had problems as well. And the sand specification really isn't a disadvantage. I just want to mention it because that's really the heart and lungs of the system, and it needs to meet the specification. So ensure that you provide. Uh, proper review and inspection and um, you know sampling to do a gradation analysis. So how would we address some of these um, disadvantages? Well, for clogging, with the improved dispersal system with better air exchange, uh, we could address that. As far as land intensive, we can reduce the footprint by stacking the system and we have increased loading rates as well. Cold temp temperature performance, We'll bury the system, we'll put it below grade and protect it. And we already talked about the sand. So here we have our sand um, specification. And it's basically the ASTM C33 sand. Most of you probably have heard of that, but it's concrete sand. So any local precaster of concrete is going to have this readily available or a source for it where other contractors could go and buy as well. We talked a little bit about the venting system. So we look at the first picture here on the left, and we can see a, a dose came in and filled up the pipe. It started to distribute the length of the pipe and get infiltrated into the soil. And then when the dose goes away and we're over on the right side, the air is going to come back in to fill that void. And the pipe, the large open space of the pipe, has lots of uh, provision for air and oxygen to come in to supply those microbes with oxygen. So we can reduce clogging by providing more oxygen. 
So again, it's just an enhancement of a sand filter. So let's talk a little bit about our um, our project. This is an intermittent recirculating buried sand filter with gravity flow. By gravity flow, uh, I mean pump to gravity in this case, just to meet some site constraints. The, the design flow for this was at 50,000 gallons a day. A little bit about the community. Uh, it's a lakeside community, as you saw from the uh, from the pictures, or I will be showing you from the pictures coming up, uh, 145 homes, Lake Centipede, New Hampshire. It used to be mostly seasonal, but over the years, more and more have become year-round homes. High nitrate levels were detected in the downgrading monitoring wells. Therefore, New Hampshire DES required an upgrade, and they stipulated no more conversions to year-round homes and no new connections until the system was improved. So that kind of prompted them to to get on it and get something done. The existing system was installed back in 1959. It consists of a single tank, an unlined sand filter, and a rapid infiltration basin. And the collection system was installed as shallow as possible into high bedrock and high groundwater. This was actually a benefit because it minimizes infiltration into the system. There are two pump stations that pump up to the plant. A pilot project was installed in 2001 with recycling uh, treated effluent back to the sludge layer of the tank, and it proved to be effective. During that period, they also evaluated options for a new conventional wastewater treatment plant. Seven vendors submitted bids, and the selected bidder came in at $1.2 million. That's in 2005 dollars. But upgrading the filter was proven to meet the treatment goal and was less than half the cost. So let's have a look at our system here. I'm going to take you in from uh, from the stars right down to uh, our little bit of New England. Here we come zooming in. You'll see New Hampshire. I hope no one gets a little air sick here with the spinning. Of course, we haven't traveled in a while, so that may be the case. Here's Lake Sunapee. Here's Blodgett Landing. You can see the community around the lake. And here is our treatment site. As I mentioned, wastewater gets pumped up to the site. So it's a, a cleared opening within, uh, within the woods. And then another view, and we're going to come down on top of this here. You can see the two ribs at either end of the project, the rapid infiltration basins. So here we are. Wastewater <coughs> gets pumped up to the headworks, which has a trash filter. Okay. Then it's going to go through a flow splitter box. Uh, this can direct sewage to one or both primary tanks. These are IMOF tanks, which we will discuss. The tanks have a volume of 34,000 gallons each. Each tank can be isolated from flow to perform routine maintenance. Next, the wastewater discharges to a flow equalization tank, which then pumps F1 up to the sand filters. F1 is distributed to four equally sized uh, filter beds. All four beds are contained inside an impermeable liner. The upper level rows are placed to allow the treated liquid to pass between the rows of the, of the uh, lower level. At the bottom of the bed is a collection system of pipes that delivers water to a pumping station that then recycles 80 percent of the water back to the sludge layers in the IMOF tanks and the remaining 20 percent is discharged out to the rapid infiltration basins. The ribs are gravity dispersal fields, uh, pump to gravity as, as well. These basins offer further treatment by the soil prior to the filtrate entering the local aquifer. I do get questions on these type of systems. Well, what is specifically required for O&M? Because everyone says, oh, it's low O&M, low O&M. So we, we called up the operator and um, got the full rundown. So what's required is a grade one operator by uh, the state of New Hampshire. It, it is a full-time uh, position required per the permit. Not that the system needs it, but the permit required it. So as a result, the full-time operator is um, not very busy. Uh, there is a flow meter I should have mentioned. Rotors are you're visually inspected periodically to verify that they are rotating freely. The trash filter, when, it, when the wastewater comes in, it went through two grinder pumps at each pump station. So there's really nothing to do with the trash filter. Everything passes through. The primary tanks, um, they're going to pump the solids once they've reached a level of three foot of depth. 
Uh, this equates to about once per year. The flow EQ tanks and the recirculation dispersal pump tanks. Uh, the recommendation there per the permit is to pump once every three years, visually check the pumps and floats quarterly. The distribution box has four valves to evenly distribute, distribute the flow that shall be checked quarterly uh, to make sure those are, aren't plugged up or anything. Uh, the sand filter, mow the surface as necessary, inspect the surface for erosion or burrowing rodents. And the ribs, inspect for equal flows, clogging, and remove excessive growth and weeds. Uh, this, as it turns out, is the biggest time consumer for the, uh, for the operator, is just clearing out the weeds. I'll talk a little bit about the Imhoff tank. What is an Imhoff tank? Well, think of it as an optimized septic tank. A septic tank provides us with primary treatment. An Imhoff tank is an improvement on the traditional septic tank. And it's been in practice um, for over a century. It was patented back in 1906. The main advantage compared to the traditional septic tank is better sludge separation, which allows for more complete settling and digestion. So this is almost similar to a two-compartment septic tank. The, set, the baffles in this case are vertical instead of horizontal as a, think of a, a regular septic tank as a plug flow reactor. So that's an IMOF tank, pretty interesting. The flows for the site, what are the actual flows? Well, we have the flows here from 2018, the average flow a little over 16,500 gallons and the peak flow just over 22,000 gallons. I mentioned here, if we saw any I and I, we would see it here with their flow recordings, which you can see during uh, spring and late spring, we're really not seeing any uh, large increase in flow. So it's nice that the, um, that the collection system is either watertight and or just above the water table, not receiving any, any inflow. The, um, the treatment levels here of, of the system. Uh, let's take a look at the TSS. Um, so the TSS coming in is about 122 on average, and you can see we're getting below five, I'm sorry, below 10, so single digits at five is the average. So a little over 95% reduction there. Total nitrogen, we're seeing a 72% reduction there. BOD is looking good as well. And the BOD and the TSS are both sub 10, which is what we would expect from sand filters. And keep in mind, this is data accumulated from January 2012 all the way through to uh, November 2020. So let's look specifically at the BOD. Here you can see the inflow, typical characteristic of what we would see from any treatment plant. You know, it's up and down. Um, for the influent, but look at the effluent line, the red line down on the bottom. It is flat line, it is stable, it is robust treatment, and it's very consistent treatment, which is what we'd expect for a sand filter. Very, very um, consistent treatment here. TSS, kind of the same thing going on. The effluent coming in, um, you know, over 100 milligrams per liter, but look at the effluent line, again, flat line on the bottom. It's averaging at five milligrams per liter for years and years. And uh, you know, we're not seeing any uh, seasonal changes due to temperatures or anything else in terms of the effluent being discharged. Okay, let's look at the fecal. Fecal, we do have one point here that's probably an outlier. Um, I'm thinking they probably had something in the jar that got collected uh, because we wouldn't normally see that at all. But anyway, um, the average in, influent, you know, over 10 million, and the average effluent, again, um, very stable, very robust treatment, um, uh, several levels of log removal here. Very, very stable treatment. And then we get to the nitrogen. Um, average influence coming in just below 30, average effluent is below 10. And again, this is, is pretty darn stable if we look at the the, um, the treatment levels here provided by the resort factor in the sand filter. Um, and keep in mind, this is done with no chemical additions of uh, alkalinity or carbon, and you know, just a class one operator. So 
not much uh, O and M cost to achieve these results. Very, very simple treatment. So in conclusion, what can we say? <clears throat> Decentralized systems can be an effective solution. Uh, the system can be adapted to fit your site conditions. And simple solutions, such as a sand filter, uh, can be investigated as an option and can be customized to treat for specific contaminants such as nitrogen. So I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this presentation. Uh, I look forward to your questions and I look forward to the opportunity of working with you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Amit Kaldate. I'm a domain leader with Suvez. And today I'll be talking about uh, an exciting technology called membrane aerated biofilm reactor. Uh, this is a general outline of my talk. Uh, I'll introduce the technology initially, uh, explain what it is, how it works, and then I will uh, do a deep dive into specific aspects of this technology uh, related to the process intensification, uh, the benefits of energy efficiency and resiliency. Uh, and I will also present um, case studies and performance data along the way. So what is a membrane aerated biofilm reactor? Uh, in this slide on, on the left-hand side, it's shown a single fiber or filament uh, of MABR where air uh, is introduced at the top and oxygen preferentially only diffuses through the membrane wall onto the biofilm which is growing on the outside surface of the membrane. Uh, so it's, it's basically uh, uh, oxygen selective membrane which allows uh, only the passage of oxygen and it's also key, important to keep in mind that it is not uh, a filtration membrane. So, so no water is filtered through the membranes, water never passes through the membrane. It is always on the outside of the membranes. So on the right hand side is a schematic which shows uh, what, the progression of oxygen uh, from inside the membrane lumen through the membrane wall into the biofilm progressively moving from left to right and, uh, and then also the progression of the pollutants namely ammonia and COD from the bulk liquid phase uh, diffusing into uh, the biofilm and and, and then there is opportunity for the reaction inside the biofilm between oxygen and, and these pollutants. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, it's a very different type of biofilm as compared to any of the conventional uh, suspended growth systems uh, employing MLSS or, or a conventional uh, biofilm system where everything, uh, including oxygen and the pollutants, have to diffuse from the bulk liquid phase. So in case of MABRs, uh, we, we are developing uh, what are known as counter diffusional biofilms. And these have significant benefits because the biofilm uh, is, is now always saturated with oxygen. So we have completely eliminated the mass transfer limitation associated with oxygen diffusion from the bulk liquid phase. And that improves the nitrification quite significantly because the biofilms are then uh, dominated by nitrifiers. Uh, so this shows uh, what we call a cord of MABR, which consists of uh, these individual uh, individual fibers of MABR uh, arranged along the circumference. At the center is the support layer in gray here. And the biofilm is growing on, 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 on the outside surface of the membranes. Again, the same process happens on each of these uh, MABR uh, fibers. Uh, the ammonia gets oxidized in the biofilm and the resulting nitrate uh, then moves into the bulk liquid phase where it gets denitrified. Uh, and because uh, the oxygen that is entering into the biofilm is always consumed completely within the biofilm uh, and so no oxygen escapes uh, escapes the biofilm 
and it doesn't impact then the bulk liquid uh, dissolved oxygen concentration or ORP. That's why even if MABR is an aerobic process at heart, uh, we can implement this in the anoxic zones and that's uh, in fact its ideal location as well uh, in order to carry out simultaneous nitrification and, and denitrification. So starting with the, the Zeeland filament, individual fiber, uh, Zeeland cord, uh, we, we can move on to uh, move on to the modules where thousands of these cards uh, are assembled together and 48 of these modules make up a single Zeeland cassette uh, which is on the right hand side. At the top is also shown uh, an inlet pipe for process air. Uh, which which then it's split into 48 uh, individual laterals that supply air to each of the modules and we use the same uh, air at the exhaust end at the bottom for mixing and scouring up the cassette so we do not need any additional source of air for for mixing and scouring and that increases the energy efficiency of the process even further so here I have shown uh, one, I would say, recommended uh, configuration of implementing MABR where you add these uh, MABR cassettes at the front end of the biological treatment, uh, secondary process. Uh, in many cases, if the plant has total nitrogen limits, you will have some sort of anoxic zone, uh, which, is, which is also important because then you can intensify the, the, the process in a dual manner you are intensifying the process by growing uh, growing the nitrifiers in the anoxic zone uh, without cannibalizing the volume in the downstream aerobic zone and then you are also uh, intensifying uh, it by simultaneously uh, achieving denitrification also in the same zone so SND is happening here as well uh, the rest of the process can operate as, as, as it were uh, in fact in many cases you can reduce the, the suspended uh, solids, the, the MLSs in the downstream aerobic zone because quite significant amount of uh, nitrification is happening on the MABR so you don't need a high SRT for that which also means that you can reduce the solids loading on the clarifier they would have higher capacity and will there will not be a need to build new clarifiers as the capacity comes up. For process air you can have a dedicated small blower for the for the MABR cassettes, or you can just add add a tap for uh, for these cassettes from the existing processor network. Just to give you an idea about uh, how energy efficient the process is, each of these uh, cassettes require only five SCFM of, of air. So looking at the applications where the process is suitable, you can uh, you can use this for increasing the capacity for uh, removal of ammonia, so nitrification, as well as uh, total nutrients removal, uh, the SND and, and the phosphorus removal as well. Uh, you can obviously use this for high strength ammonia streams like centrates and leachates uh, and where obviously you need to reduce the amount of energy associated with the process because it has uh, significant practical operational cost saving benefits and you can implement the process in a phased manner uh, so that's another benefit so you don't have to plan for 20 years in the future you can approach it uh, say like five years at a time and the resiliency we'll spend some time on moving on to the process intensification uh, typically for most of the systems nitrification is the is the bottleneck in a sense it's the slowest kinetic step so in order to achieve that uh, can either increase the aerobic volumes or can increase the MLSs in the process but both of these uh, approaches have significant costs associated with them either in terms of the larger bioreactors or larger clarifiers or if you increase the MLSs you, by using something like MBR you still have to have membranes at the end. So with MABR uh, or our Zeeland process you, you, you basically avoid those problems. We we carry out intensification uh, by, by growing nitrifiers on the MABR cassettes where they wouldn't grow otherwise, that is in the anoxic zone, uh, and then also, also by reducing uh, the aerobic SRT. So 
uh, in a truly hybrid system, you have both the, the biofilm as well as the suspended growth phase. Uh, and, and we are removing significant amount of ammonia and at the front of the process by doing so uh, on the Z lung cassettes, which are very nitrifier rich, uh, up to 10 times uh, is what we have seen in our microbial analysis of these biofilms. Uh, also, another benefit is that uh, the biofilm, the nitrifying biofilm, can provide the seeding for the downstream uh, aerobic zone. The simplicity of the process is sometimes overlooked, but it's it's important to keep in mind. Uh, you can easily upgrade the existing uh, plants uh, without uh, without adding new construction, without adding new new infrastructure or tanks. The deployment is very fast. The installation is very fast. An example shown here uh, is a full scale facility where we didn't even stop the operation of that train, where where the cassettes uh, are are installed. And another important aspect. Uh, as compared to any other intensification solutions uh, is that with MABR there is no impact on the hydraulics of the existing plant. So you don't have to reroute the flows, you don't have to build new tanks entirely for, for a newer process uh, and, and, and there is no additional head loss. So for the energy efficiency as you can see here uh, MABR is up to four times uh, more energy efficient as compared to uh, the other, other aeration option, typically fine bubble aeration. Uh, there are additional benefits. Uh, in addition to the savings in the process aeration, you can also save energy on the amount of BOD that would be consumed for simultaneous denitrification. You can also reduce or completely eliminate uh, internal recycle because the nitrates are being generated on the xenon cassettes in the anoxic zone. Uh, and, 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 and you can presumably get uh, better alpha values for, for the downstream aeration as well. The process resilience aspect partly comes from the biofilm nature of the process, uh, where the biofilm always stays inside the reactor and it's not susceptible to wash out. And uh, we have also seen because of this, there is a rapid response to any influent fluctuations of say uh, flows, loads, or in, in many cases, toxicity as well. And we have also seen stable cold temperature performance uh, using uh, MABR process. The picture here is for uh, a full cassette demonstration we did at uh, Chicago's O'Brien uh, wastewater plant. That's a huge facility, 280 MGD. So we can think of uh, a, like sort of a checklist for, for process resilience at specific plants. Uh, we can see if the process performs well, in, 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 even in, in case of uh, any failures of the control system, can it, can it recover quickly? Can it withstand extreme weather events? Uh, can it resist the washout of the biomass? Can it be run using a standby power? Um, and so on and so forth. So we can add, add more items to this. On all these aspects, MABRs, uh, check these boxes. Uh, the process is uh, ha consumes low enough energy that you can easily operate it on a standby power, uh, and so it will be able to achieve and, and continue to provide the, the permit guarantees during during those period. Uh, another benefit is is really the peak trimming because uh, MABR is implemented uh, in the front part, in the upstream part of the secondary process. Uh, any additional peaks of ammonia coming in are, are easily uh, attenuated and shaved off. So as a, as, as a case study, this is our full scale facility in, in Yorkville, Bristol uh, in, in Illinois, about an hour west of Chicago. Uh, for them, uh, they, they had two main reasons to look at any intensification solutions. One was about 45% increase in the organic loading. On, on the plant because of the industry in the town and, and they're also looking at a total phosphorus limit of less than one milligram per liter in, in Illinois. Uh, so the, as you can see in this picture, the existing plant is completely built out. Uh, so only option they had is this land across the creek, but when they evaluated the cost was uh, significant. Uh, and when they looked at MABR option, it was a perfect fit for them. Uh, this is a picture uh, also of, of the two batteries at the plant and it, uh, it also shows uh, the five cells which are in, in series in each of the batteries where operating 
uh, it's completely aerobic zones before upgrades but after upgrades uh, uh, we converted the first cell into an anaerobic zone and the second cell into an anoxic zone where we implemented the Zelum cassettes, the MABR, and the remaining three cells continue to operate as, uh, as aerobic cells. So you can see that we reduced the aerobic volume by 40%, uh, but the process is still able to handle that additional 45% load and able to meet their nutrient uh, guarantees. So they have ammonia limit, a seasonal limit in the range of 1.6 to 2.3 and total phosphorus of less than less than one. So we, for the resilience aspect, we looked at the performance of the system under uh, wet weather conditions. So we picked out one of the worst uh, wet weather events, which happened in early February last year, uh, in, in 2019, in fact. Uh, you, you can see the, 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 the flows were twice the average flow during that, that peak event. And we also recorded the influent ammonia in the second panel and in the bottom panel is what we measured as oxygen transfer rate into the biofilm. Uh, and what we saw that uh, during, during the event, obviously the ammonia concentration is reduced because of the higher flow. Uh, and, and the OTR also goes down a little bit but it comes back to its normal value within within two days. So very quick response to the system. And the system continued to, to provide the required ammonia, effluent ammonia values, even if the OTR was somewhat lower during the day. Uh, we also looked at the resilience from the point of view of shutting down the systems. So we simulated a short-term shutdown of the system, say 24 hour, and somewhat longer term, uh, 48 is shown here, but we also tested 72 hours as well as one week long shutdowns. And we also simulated a wet weather event with, with, uh, with the flooding. Uh, under all these circumstances, all these scenarios, uh, the, the result was the same. Uh, MAB, our system comes back to its pre-event uh, performance level within very short period, 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, this is another uh, another example of, of, a, of a pilot where any variation in the influent ammonia concentrations uh, are completely attenuated. So this is uh, this is what I was mentioning as, as peak trimming effect. Uh, another aspect of, re of resilience is related to temperature. So this is the pilot that we ran in UK uh, in the United Kingdom for over a, over a year. And it shows that between typical temperature range of 10 to 20 degrees C, uh, the nitrification rate, which is plotted here on the vertical axis, remains fairly stable in the range of two to three uh, grams per meter square per day. Uh, this is uh, some of our current work related to resiliency. Uh, uh, this is a project funded by National Science Foundation in collaboration with City of Houston and Rice University. Uh, the pilot is on site right now in, in, in city of Houston and will be there for another year. So there is attention for the resiliency of the wastewater treatment systems at the federal level and, and biofilm systems are, 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 are being investigated and, and viewed as, as viable solutions to, to handle the resiliency. For the performance data, we, we, we look at these three parameters, oxygen transfer efficiency, oxygen transfer rate and nitrification rate. Uh, OTE is quite similar in definition to other systems, but the, the, uh, the other systems such as the, the fine bubble diffusion, but the important uh, difference is the, the difference in the OTE values. For MABR, these are in the range of 30 to 40% as compared to 10 to 12% for fine bubbles, so almost four times, three to four times higher. Uh, OTR rates are in the range of 8 to 12 grams of oxygen delivered to the biofilm per square meter of the membrane surface per day. And nitrification rates again are 3 to 6 times higher as compared to say conventional biofilm systems such as IFAS. Uh, so these are, these are significantly higher numbers for all these parameters. Uh, as an example of the, the performance data I'm showing here, the oxygen transfer rate uh, plotted as a frequency graph on, on the horizontal axis. And then on, on the vertical axis is the frequency of these values occurring. And on the right hand side uh, are the summary statistics uh, represented as 25th, 50th and 75th percentile. 
As you can see, at say as an example, the 50th percentile, the OTR is in the range of 7.5 to 11.3. So uh, around 10 is what I was showing earlier, and then higher values for higher percentile. Uh, important thing again to note is all these uh, different demonstration studies, pilots were operated, which are plotted here. These are essentially uh, thousands of data points. Uh, for these seven pilots, we have done uh, more than 30 demonstration studies by now. Uh, and all, all the data points, despite their differences in the operational characteristics, such as the loads, temperatures, uh, the configuration, whether it's a hybrid system or a flow through system, uh, these values fall within a very narrow range uh, that indicates the robustness of the MAVI. Uh, this is just a quick example of the first full cassette demonstration plant we did at Chicago's O'Brien uh, facility, that large 280 MGD plant. Uh, we did this uh, about five years ago now, uh, where they are looking at, uh, again being in Illinois, looking at the total phosphorus limits and their preference was to do BioP. Uh, and also during some part of the winter, their nitrification is, is challenged. And for a large utility of this size, any savings in energy are welcome. So they are committed to being energy neutral and uh, a technology like MABR helps them uh, move in that direction quite significantly. So we ran the pilot for a year and, and demonstrated all these objectives, namely they can nitrify year round. Uh, there is no need for them to build new tanks for BioP. They can intensify the process enough with MABR so that uh, they can carry out BioP in the existing reactors, making room for that. And, and there is significant energy saving for them, about 30%, uh, which, is, uh, which is, I would say, millions of dollars per year for them. Uh, so this is a summary. Uh, in, 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 in summary, I would say MABR solves big challenges that uh, our wastewater industry faces in terms of the nutrient sustainability and footprints. Uh, additional benefits include the process resiliency, simplicity, and ease of implementation. Uh, the process, of course, is resilient mainly because of the biofilm nature of the system as well as the contradiffusional uh, nature of the biofilm itself. Uh, and we, we looked at the data uh, uh, at, at, uh, at Yorkville as well as in Adelaide in Ontario. Uh, and also MABR systems provide the, uh, the, as, the aspect of SND as well as the ammonia peak peak trimming. Now, thank you for your time and attention this, uh, this afternoon. If you have any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, also, my contact information is here. So if you have any questions, you can send me email as well afterwards. Thank you again. G'day, my name is CJ Strain. I'm a chemical engineer and the product manager for filtration at Nexum. Today, my session three title is Achieving Ultra Low Phosphorus and Metals Removal at Burville, Rhode Island. Some of the challenges that were presented to Burville came in 2011 when they received a consent agreement from the Rhode Island DEM for phosphorus and copper removal. Now the uh, phosphorus was pretty low, it was a seasonal 0.1 milligrams per liter, a little bit higher in the, in the winter time. But the copper was actually quite stringent at eight micrograms per liter. And the, uh, the DEM was again trying to uh, reduce copper below the, uh, the background levels in the receiving waters there. Now, in addition to the ultra low phosphorus, the nutrient removal, the trace metals compliance, uh, we were, the, the town of Burville was also looking at TSS reduction for improved disinfection and uh, potentially reduce any scavenging effects or side reactions with that disinfection process as they use chlorine and uh, prior to their discharge. So a lot of, a lot of similar sites, similar size sites, similar um, sites in the New England area could benefit from examining their story a little bit closer. Now I think we all understand why removing phosphorus is important and the dangers of overloading the receiving waters with phosphorus as we can see in this diagram I'm going to share with you here. So the, uh, the majority of the phosphorus discharge can come from a lot of different natural and human sources. 
um, what we're talking about today with permits of uh, wastewater plants, point source dischargers, um, it, it's a fair amount. You know, it, it, it can be between 5 and 10 percent of the total load to these receiving waters. So generally, that's why they receive so much attention, uh, that and they're easy to, easy to regulate. So that, that um, phosphorus loading from human sources from human waste uh, will generally enter the receiving water stream. It'll enter the uh, phosphorus cycle in the, in the water column in the receiving waters. It'll be intaken by plants, consumed by um, uh, animals, etc., aquatic creatures. And then, of course, as those creatures, as those plants die, uh, it can decompose over time and then, of course, re-enter the water column as uh, inorganic pee. And, of course, that can become a vicious cycle leading to um, a very inhospitable environment for native fish and um, native species. So, I think we, um, the, you know, the Rhode Island EEM, the EPA has made it very clear that uh, this is a situation we all want to prevent. Now, as noted, the facility plan in 2014, well, the, yes, the facility plan in 2014 um, outlined how Burrowville was going to proceed with their upgrade and address the limits that you currently see on, on screen. So overall, the plant that they were uh, designing and dealing with and building at that point in time was for a 1.5 MGD average day flow and a 4.5 MGD peak flow. Uh, effluent limits for total phosphorus and copper were in that consent agreement and uh, at levels of uh, phosphorus of 0.1 milligrams per liter, copper of 8 micrograms per liter. Now this configuration was um, or the configuration for filtration was implemented, was designed in as a single stage tertiary filtration process between the secondary clarification and the chlorine disinfection at the site. The plant has been meeting its phosphorus requirements very effectively, very efficiently. So on screen is a snapshot, just a, a 12 months period in time shared by the plant superintendent who is uh, Michael Emond. He's, uh, he's a, a very good and knowledgeable superintendent and very easy to talk to if you want to gain a little bit more information about this plant. He's uh, a very uh, meetable person to sharing um, his experience, etc. But on screen again, you can see the total phosphorus charted between November of 2017 up to October of 2018. And generally what you see for the secondary level of phosphorus is pretty consistent with how it's uh, how it's been operating year to year, and again the plant has no issue meeting the 0.1 milligrams per liter permit. And you can see quite often they're half or less than that, than that permit at times. As we move on to the copper graph over that uh, uh, same period of time, you can see that uh, they can optimize the plant for copper. Um, their target, of course, is eight milligram or eight micrograms per liter, I'm sorry. Got to be very careful on how uh, we use our units here when talking about trace metals and elements. Um, but generally the system is very capable of, of driving that copper down essentially to the detection limits of the test. Uh, we just want to make sure that the plant is operate, uh, optimized so that the owner is getting the, the best value for you know, their costs and uh, upkeep and inputs. So again, uh, successfully meeting that copper permit. Now, one of the other benefits that we see when we look at the data at Burrowville is very low effluent turbidity discharge from the plant. And that's going to be um, true of, of any tertiary filtration, in, but especially of a, of a filtration platform such as this one, which is also California Title 22 approved for Class A reuse. So in general, you will see low turbidity coming from systems like this, which is going to be a benefit to the site you'll generally use less effort uh, expended for disinfection. Your UV transmittance goes up, your side reactions, comp competing reactions uh, go down if you're using chlorine. So turbidity, low turbidity is, is certainly a good thing in these applications. So we saw how the system functions or performs, I should say. Let's talk about how it functions. Uh, the, da the, the data is nothing short of, of world class, uh, so let me take a few minutes to discuss you know, the steps that were taken 
to get us to the point where we uh, where we have data like that, performance like that coming from the plant. So the Blue Pro, the reactive filtration system that was the uh, the basis of design for the plant upgrade is really what is uh, achieving that level of treatment. It features a continuous regeneration of reactive filter media within a moving bed sand filter. At ultra low concentrations of phosphorus, it's actually inefficient to rely on diffusion to create contact uh, between phosphorus, which is dissolved in the water, and the reactant, uh, whatever that reactant may be. Here in my illust illustration, you see basically a, a ferric cation being that reactant. And, and what we're ultimately aiming for is for that phosphate and that uh, ferric or that cation, whether it be aluminum or, or even cerium, they have to collide, they have to react, they have to interface with each other. So in general, uh, we don't want to use a coagulation filtration bottle unless that's a, a, a much higher permit level. When we get down to these low permit levels, these really trace residuals in the water, we want to use something that's more efficient. So, um, and, and the reason I say that is because uh, if we're just doing like a coagulation filtration based uh, removal technique, uh, it's limited by diffusion models. And as the engineering community is really very well familiar with, uh, there's multiple factors, including a very strong temperature dependence within those uh, diffusion models. And therefore, it requires a lot of extra energy or mixing, um, if anything can be done to overcome those limits of diffusion. So with reactive filtration, which is what Burrowville implemented, um, it's, it's really the best for, as I mentioned, ultra low limits. At ultra low concentrations of phosphorus reactive filtration, it, it's much more efficient. And it's more efficient because it provides and creates con contact for filtering phosphorus through reactant coated sand. So every individual sand granule in there has a coating of that metal hydroxide, which will absorb phosphorus as that is, is the incoming water stream with phosphorus trickles through that media. So it's really about surface exposure and increasing the probability of collision between phosphorus and your reactant surface or reactant period to pull it from solution. The other benefit is that it eliminates the need for a flocculation stage. So for Burrowville, this come, again comes out of their secondary clarifiers and it integrates inline injection of chemical mixing before flow splitting to the, uh, the multiple filter cells that are on site. We're going to talk a little bit more about this process as we continue the presentation, but I want to talk briefly about the platform, the individual filter itself. It is, as I mentioned, the California Title 22 approved uh, filter platform. The other benefits that it gives to the owner and the operator is it's very simple uh, to maintain. It's non-mechanical. There's no moving parts within the filter itself. It's a gravity filter, so it's very energy efficient, which is uh, something that's looked upon very positively by permitting agencies and funding agencies, which is probably a little bit more critical to the owners at this point. And it's continuously backwashing. What does that mean? There's no cycling. There's no intermittent backwash that has to occur. And, and the reason that's good is because with intermittent backwashes, you'll get a cycle of water quality. It's best just before backwash, and then you get breakthrough uh, once you clean all the media, all, all the, the interstitial spaces of the media of any collected TSS, etc. So with a cyclical backwash filter, you, your, your filtrate quality varies. This does not. It's pretty much dead simple and constant, um, which is very nice from an operations um, monitoring perspective. And it's, as I mentioned, very simple. Operators love this platform. Giving you a little bit more detail on how this filter functions and how uh, reactive filtration in general works, the inlet water for these systems enters a filter cell and flows through a central distribution assembly down to the bottom of the filter. There's radial distribution arms that allow the, the water to flow upward through the cell and filtrate in the headspace over the media flows over a fixed weir at the top. 
Now, in the middle of the cell, you have a sand washer, and the, and the bottom of that's open to the filtrate. The filtrate is used to backwash, again, at a continuous rate. So the water is, is flowing upward. The media is actually flowing downward. So you get counter current flow, and you'll inject your chemical, again, to coat that media, so you're doing reactive filtration. And that coating is going to be the thickest here at the bottom where it first contacts the water, and then um, as you get higher in the bed, it's clean media coming from that sand washer. Now, your heaviest loaded media will be funneled to an airlift pipe, which takes that um, the media that's coated with uh, metal salt and phosphorus and TSS. It scrubs that as it rises, as the media is lifted to the wash box. And then your clean media is allowed to fall back to the top of the bed while that upflow velocity in the sand washer carries away the waste solids. And then the only thing to, uh, to add to that is phosphorus is uh, uh, present in a range of concentrations or can be present in a range of concentrations. And that's what's being reacted and taken out, uh, taken out from the filter. So Burrowville is not the only facility near Boston that has uh, benefited from reactive filtration. Now, I want to share this in case uh, you want to do a site visit to one of these um, one of these systems that's been active and operating in the region. Uh, this uh, uh, site at Marlboro, Mass. This is the the Westerly plant, and it was um, started up in in 2012. It was designed by CDM Smith, and so you can see the operating data uh, for for several years there. And they had a seasonal permit as well as a 60-day rolling average, and it's based on a TMDL. So currently that summertime limit is a 0.1, but it may be as low as 0.07 in the future. So you can see the consistency of that system. Now, we mentioned that reactive filtration is more efficient than coagulation filtration. I gave a couple reasons for that. Well, here's, here's a data snapshot. This is a, a complete month from, from Marlboro's first year of operations, July of 2012. And it just shows you the plant influent total phosphorus, plant effluent total phosphorus, again, in their uh, DMR reports. So you can see the, the average just down here at the bottom. Well, you, when you take that ratio and the ratio of uh, chemical used on site, Fe to P ratio for the entire site is 1.6, 1.7 um, on a mole basis. And we're achieving residuals that are sub 0.1. You know, the monthly average is 0.06. So it just, it, it's a testament to how efficient this process can be. And uh, the reason why I wanted to share that, that story with you at Marlboro. Now, Marlboro likewise observes very good copper polish, polishing. They're not, excuse me, they're not permitted for it currently uh, in this regard as, as Burrowville is, but they do record and observe. And as you can see from observations during the uh, the 2017 year here at Bur or Marlboro, they, they do have quite a variable and in, in high inlet copper loading to the plant, uh, but with the reactive filtration as the tertiary step before UV disinfection at this site, uh, they will generally, generally average less than five micrograms per liter of copper. So again, just a testament to the process at one more uh, regional site nearby. So in summary, I wanted to share reactive versus a, a conventional filtration, a coagulation filtration approach. So reactive filtration um, relies heavily on unreacted metal salt being um, injected or, or presented to the media that's in the filter vessel, coating that media so that we have a, a surface, uh, a very high surface area actually available to pull phosphate out of the, the water, uh, the wastewater. And that works very efficiently as, as the data just presented shows. Now we wanna contrast this to more uh, the, the conventional approach that I was talking about. Again, that was limited by diffusion, limited by um, being just a sim simply integrated as a physical barrier approach and only that. And that's basically a coagulation filtration um, sequence method where you have a mix and flocculation stage which grabs phosphorus and has to grow a particle large enough to physically be removed. So that's, uh, th these are the limitations that reactive filtration overcomes and we see the benefit in the data. Some design benchmarks that I wanna share with you and, and were used in the design of the Burrowville plant. So on a hydraulic basis, 
daily de daily design maximums are generally less than 4 GPM per square foot. Uh, per square foot. Peak hour design in general is, is less than 5 GPM per square foot. Now this system was flow tested at higher rates and they were sustained for you know multiple hours but those these these are general benchmarks and we we can't just look at hydraulics we do have to look at look at the amount of solids loading that's being presented to the filter as well and on from that perspective we want to be a daily design less than two pounds per square foot per day uh, certainly keeping our peak hour less than two and a half pounds per square foot per day if we stay within these envelopes we will have generally a very well designed reactive filtration system uh, what else can you uh, uh, expect uh, as, as far as the design conditions for the site, you can expect a head loss averaging between one and three feet of driving head uh, with a design maximum around four feet. And then constituent loading, plan for a nominal 90% removal efficiency and you'll be very safe. Uh, systems like this with reactive filtration, you can push them higher. Uh, I've observed you know, 95, 97% uh, removal efficiencies on many sites. Uh, again, we just want to be safe in our design benchmarks and then um, allow studies to uh, validate um, our design from there. Speaking of validation, how did Burroughville validate reactive filtration during technology selection? Well, we did uh, what a lot of sites do, and that's uh, we, we conducted and completed a pilot system or a pilot project of the reactive filtration system. So that's what you see pictured here on site. Uh, the entire pilot system arrived on a 50 foot flatbed uh, trailer and then uh, there were filters offloaded to simulate the um, filtration. All of the controls, chemical systems, PLC, etc., is all in a 20 foot container that stayed trailer mounted um, to operate that filter system. And that pilot was conducted and completed in uh, fall of 2013. Here's the data from that pilot process, that validation. Generally, you can break down the pilot uh, data into four phases. The first being a uh, loading and TP optimization phase, which was completed uh, over the course of about a week and achieved the, uh, the phosphorus uh, target pretty easily. You can see the copper was still a little bit high that first week. Uh, there was uh, a, a following period of uh, a stress testing, phosphorus and lo in TSS loading to the filter. You can see some of that optimization and that stress test helped with the copper, but we weren't quite there yet. So there was further optimization conducted um, a couple of different periods there uh, to, uh, to maintain and to record the parameters required for uh, compliant copper results. So the pilot was, was a tremendous success. Um, so what does this look like in the real world? If you were to visit the site today, here's, here's the um, overview of the plant processes you would see. The influent to the tertiary system is actually plant secondary effluent. And then that comes in, there's a, a flow measurement of the system is actually uh, going to be the, the plant flow meter at this particular site. And then you have your chemical system injecting chemical. Again, it has to be well mixed, but we don't want to flocculate and, um, and consume the chemical reactivity of that chemical that's being injected. We, we don't want uh, flocks to form and then uh, fold in on themselves. We want that to uh, address and be presented to the media. So we have head loss monitoring and then right into flow distribution to a number of filter modules. Now all of those filter modules, again, there's no mechanical aspect within the filter, but they do need an airlift pump to operate. So that's where you have airlift control and uh, that airlift control is controlling the air from a pneumatic system, which we'll share a couple of pictures from the site so that the uh, visual learners in the audience can uh, pinpoint a few key features. So again, there's a, there's a compressor system feeding uh, the, the airlift control panels, which you see here and here. Each cell has um, air control uh, for pressure, for flow rate, etc. Each of these is an isolatable filter cell. Um, so on this side, this is half the system. On the other side of the uh, influent flow chamber, chamber is the other half of the reactive filtration system. Um, there's uh, aluminum decking or covers with 
access hatches to those wash boxes that we talked about in the prior cross section. And then we talked a lot about media. There is a good amount of media in these filters. Generally, you're talking about filter bed depths between 40 and 60 inches as measured on the exterior wall of the filter. And that media after being you know, um, in the system for a while, especially with a ferric chemistry, we'll get a, a nice red color like this. Um, and that's just a hydrospheric oxide coating, again, that is adsorptive or reactive to phosphate uh, that um, will coat out on the media over time. Again, for the, the visual learners, a couple of construction pictures. This isn't from the Burrowville site, but it is a very similar site. So each of the, uh, the filter cells um, is, is built, um, poured in place concrete, then you have prefabricated filter cones that are uh, grouted into the bottom. Then the central water distribution assembly is dropped into the cell. And the cells can have multiple, um, the filter cells can have multiple modules or, or filters within them. So pictured to the right, you see a cell that has three or four modules in it. The, the ones at Burrowville, they each had two modules per cell. But it just gives you an idea what that looks like during construction. Now, uh, the media is already in here. You see the influent header coming to, or distributing water to each of the, uh, the filter modules. The only thing missing is the uh, reject or backwash line coming from each of those wash boxes. Now, in closing, I want to wish, or I do wish to share, that this system has been well validated in dozens of installations in North America and around the world. We've got uh, a lot of stories we could share projects overseas in, in Europe, in Asia, uh, but especially throughout North America has been our primary um, beneficiary of this technology uh, in the wastewater industry. Now, one final data story that I like to share comes from uh, Citronelle, Alabama, which has uh, complied with one of the lowest permits that I'm aware of for total phosphorus. So it's lower than Burrowville, but I think it's still an applicable story to share while we're in this conversation on what, what, what can this technology do? Like, how, how far can it be pushed? We showed that a little bit with the data from Burrowville. You know, they were hitting the 0.05s, the 0.04s on some of the monthly averages in that data set I shared with you. But this plant here isn't just accidentally hitting a 0.04 or something of that nature. It was designed for a 0.02 milligrams per liter total phosphorus as written in their permit. They uh, completed construction and did the performance testing and commissioning um, by spring of 2016, and they have not missed a single month since um, commissioning, other than you know, a natural disaster, a lightning strike to plant controls. Other than that, they average a 0 0.01 milligrams per liter total phosphorus. Certainly uh, what I would consider uh, one of the best in class for phosphorus removal systems in the world. Now also at Citronelle, and finally, as we uh, would be expected, um, or as we would expect to see from a reuse filter, we have very low TSS, averaging less than two milligrams per liter here at the Citronelle site, as at the Marlboro and Burrowville plants. So not only is the technology excellent for meeting consent agreements for very low nutrients and trace elements, but we, we see very low TSS and turbidity, you know, leading to minimized effort uh, expended as well as side reactions for disinfection. So a lot of benefits to this treatment process over and above simply meeting a nutrient compliance limit. I wish to thank you for your attention today. It was a privilege to provide this presentation and the data included, and I look forward to uh, the live Q&A. Hello everyone, I am April Sargent. I'm the Compliance Manager at RMI. I have been thoroughly involved in the pilot studies for the Shinshi dehumidification system. And I just wanted to welcome you to our presentation um, on how to stop hauling water and a little bit about our pilot studies in New Hampshire and Vermont. Uh, as many of you may know, RMI has been a leader in residuals recycling for the past 25 years. We help municipal and industrial wastewater treatment plants recycle 
um, residuals such as short paper fiber, hydrosolids, biosolids. RMI has handled dried class A in the past um, and has become very familiar with the benefits of having a dried product. So RMI had a few strategic partnerships in mind. We partnered with Brattleboro, Vermont, who was our first pilot installation. And our next was Hooksit, New Hampshire, um, both of which were very successful. Brattleboro has since wrapped up their pilot study and Hooksit is about six months in. Uh, we will talk a little bit about both installations and kind of what we're doing now, our next steps uh, in this upcoming presentation. Joining me will be Charlie Hansen, our senior project manager, and Steve Nermi, our sales manager. And we'll kick the presentation off with a little video about our Hooksit installation. The top three reasons somebody should go with the Shinchi technology, uh, one would be cost savings. The footprint is the smallest on the market. And the third being, it's simple. It produces an on-site Class A product that's ready to ship directly to farm. Competitive products are hundreds of RPMs, hundreds of degrees. We're five RPMs and 170 degrees, much more of a dehumidification than a drying. The Shinchi 4800 evaporates 4,800 kilograms of water in a 24-hour period. This facility is taking in 16.5% solids and discharging 90, 93% solids. Two proprietary things with Shinchi is the slitter and the heat pumps. The heat pump's extremely efficient. The slitter is rollers, well, kind of a pasta machine, versus an extrusion, which can clog up with the fiber. So we're gonna take you right through the slitter where we increase the surface area by making noodles. Those noodles will be laid down on a belt. It's a perforated belt that allows dry, hot air to come up through the bottom, as well as convection on the top. It travels down a top belt, it turns once. It comes back on the bottom belt, and it's discharged at 90% solids. The footprint is the smallest on the market. There are really only two sizes. You've got a small unit and you've got a large unit. So it's not like we have models for all these applications. It's modular. One is seven and a half feet wide, the smaller unit. 10 foot two is the larger unit. Here at Hooksit, it's a very challenging type of wastewater solids to get the water out of. This is just what they call a secondary plant. There's no primary sludge being wasted off the process. After some initial challenges here, um, we're consistently getting about 17% and the dryer is handling it great. We're easily able to keep up with the solids production coming off the process. So in this case, if this hooks at installation, it takes about a little over three hours to get all the way through those belts. And at the end, you get out a 90 plus percent dried product. We got into this because we were interested in making a great dried product and reducing the impact from having to transport all this material. When something's wet, you might have five loads of it, but when you dry it, you have one. And that works out great. We found operation costs and maintenance costs to be very low. It's about once a week maintenance takes one to two guys about half an hour, 45 minutes. The monthly maintenance takes about four guys, 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And as far as addressing the costs, the superintendent here installed a meter just on the room itself, which encompasses the dryer and all the conveyance. So we can get real time operating costs. To run the dryer 24 hours a day, it costs about $5.85 an hour. That also translates to be about 180 kilowatt hours to dry one wet ton of product, which is even better than we could have expected. RMI is committed to compliance and our commitment to compliance ensures that the permitting process not only for the installation itself but for wherever you choose the end product to go and we really hope that that's land application is a smooth easy transition. And most importantly RMI is providing a solution to our municipal and industrial clients. Hi I'm Charlie Hansen from Resource Management. And we were fortunate to partner with such a, a, a good treatment plant in Hooksit, New Hampshire. When we started pursuing the Shinchi technology, the drying technology, they approached us about learning more about it. Fast forward, we got the dryer and we got it installed and up and running uh, last 
May, the end of last May. I recently, I had a chance to sit down virtually with Ken Canady, the superintendent at the Hunsett Wastewater Treatment Plant. So Ken, maybe you could start off by telling us a little bit about the Hunsett Wastewater Treatment Facility. We do about 700,000 gallons a day, small plant. Uh, we do not have primaries here. We're a completely secondary plant. We've also added uh, a solar component recently. It's going to lower our electric bills by 80% is what they're telling us right now. Uh, Ken, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what your thoughts were when you first got thrown into, wow, there's a big box in my truck loading bay. I asked lots of questions of Charlie and Akram and the entire team. And we were running three truckloads a week to Merrimack. Now we fill one container for RMI and it takes us two to two and a half weeks to fill the container. So we've eliminated seven runs with a truck to one. That's a lot of water we're not hauling in. And what do you think is the most important thing from a sludge management perspective? It's a dry product now. It's an odorless product now when we leave out of here. Um, once it gets 85%, there's no odor to this material at all. So we get to that 90%, now it's a class A. Um, we can farm apply it anywhere we need to. Um, so it makes it a very, lots of options for us to go with instead of just hauling to a landfill. Are you going to consider this technology as part of the permanent solution? Yes, we're definitely looking at this as the solution for what we need right now. The machine works. It's going to work into the future, and it's going to save dollars into the future. And I think all of us need to look at what the hauling costs are now and how much it's going to cost us more, with, especially with PFAS and involved in this as well. So thank you very much, Ken, and, and thank you to the team at Hookson. Thank you, Charlie, for bringing us in. So RMI... Uh, has worked with our valued partners in this initiative. And we had a dryer installed at Brattleboro, Vermont, a client we've had for over 25 years, managing their biosolids in a land application program. Well, we concluded the Brattleboro pilot, uh, went very well. We determined that we certainly would like to put a larger machine in there. And they actually would like to build a separate building to put all their drying into. So once we concluded that, we were approached by a town just north of Brattleboro, uh, the town of Rockingham. The main municipal part is called the village of Bellows Falls. And Bellows Falls has a nice little plant, an RBC plant with anaerobic digestion. They've gone through a number of upgrades over the last 10 years. Chief operator there, Rob Wheeler, was very excited to add drying to a recently upgraded dewatering um, unit. So recently I had a good fortune of being actually in person down at Bellows Falls where we got to catch up with Josh, the lab manager there, to talk a little bit about what the drying unit installed at Bellows Falls has meant for them. We successfully completed a pilot program with our longtime uh, partner Brattleboro, Vermont, at the end of last year. We also had friends up here in Bellows Falls who had been following and seen the dryer operating in Brattleboro and were very interested to see if we could bring that unit up here. So what we did is we put together a package, did the evaluation of the flow and the type of products they were making here and put it all together. And within about six weeks, we actually had the dryer physically on site and installed and ready to go. And we've been making dried biosolids here for approximately four and a half weeks. My name is Josh Kemp. I've been here for 13 years. I have a grade one license and I have a grade one in uh, laboratory. From beginning to start, we have RBC facility. We produce around 350 wet tons a year, anaerobically digested. And the service area we provide is Town of Rockingham, Walpole, and North Walpole. Historically, we were going to Claremont, New Hampshire, disposing of our sludge, and it was getting composted and reused. Um, two years ago, they had a process stop in New Hampshire, and it caused us to go to Coventry, Vermont. And now our cost of our sludge disposal has tripled. With this Cinchy dryer that we are now using, this will cut our costs quite a bit. I feel that the cost of bringing the sludge to landfills is going to be not only uncost effective, it's going to be odorous, and there's going to be other issues that are going to cause places to close down fast. The Sinshinchi technology was pretty much a no-brainer, but the cost effectiveness of drawing it, we're now filling one dumpster compared to four dumpsters in a week. 
the beneficial reuse of being able to use this drying product on farms is going to be 100% better than putting it in a landfill and wasting the opportunity to use a nitrogen. I think that the Cincinnati dryer is the way to go and a lot of plants need to re really consider having that process put in and have it looked at. Hi, I'm Steve Nermi. I'm the sales manager with Resource Management. I've been working on the Shinchi technology for a little over two years now. And what I'd like to do is take you through uh, an overview of the dehumidification process. That process starts with what we call the slitter box. The slitter box is an area where we receive the cake that's coming in. We take that cake, 18 to 25 percent solids, and we put it into a noodle form. It's almost like an industrial pasta machine. So by creating these noodles, we're increasing the surface area and we lay that down on the upper belt. There are two belts, an upper belt and a lower belt. So the air is traveling through the belt and the product uh, while it's also uh, a convection process. So as it turns from the top belt to the bottom, that product's just flipping once, minimal movement, uh, very stable product. In that process, the moist air is uh, evaporated uh, by a set of condensers and discharged through uh, a condensate pipe back to the headworks. Uh, that dry hot air, or the moist hot air, is going to proprietary heat pumps, which are extremely efficient. They're drying that um, hot air, bringing it back up to temperature, and recycling it right through that process uh, with the belt. Uh, it's 5 RPMs, 170 degrees, um, very different than the other technologies that are out there. The entire process is controlled by one touchpad, a touch screen that is on the dryer, that touch screen on the main page shows you everything that's happening from the slitter through the belts, um, your temperatures, um, the compressors that are on and off, they'll shut off for efficiencies uh, when you reach temperatures and they're not running all the time and all that is visible on one page. Uh, on another tab there, it gives you all the parameters to really dial in to the specific characteristics of your sludge. You control the upper belt speed, the lower belt speed, uh, the amount of product that's being applied to the belt through the slitter, um, all on one screen that's that's there. Um, this process does provide an on-site class A, uh, but to be class A, you need to achieve uh, vector attraction reduction and pasteurization. Uh, and in doing that, pasteurization is achieved by spending over 30 minutes on that lower belt, vector attraction reduction is achieved uh, with the 90% solids uh, being discharged on the other end. Um, if the facility is anaerobically digested and does meet the 38% reduction, um, it's only required to be 75% solids on the other end, but we almost always shoot for that 90%. It just makes a more manageable product um, and a better fertilizer. But in the event it does uh, go towards landfill or other applications that are required by regulation, uh, this is still a great means to manage the product. It's taking the water out, it's reducing the weight that's being hauled, it's reducing tipping fees that are being paid on a weight basis. Whichever direction the market goes, uh, it's just producing a better product. As far as maintenance, uh, maintenance is pretty minimal on this. It takes two people about a half an hour uh, once a week to clean the filters, there's a set of combs under the rollers in the slitter box that as they do uh, accumulate fiber, and that could be two to four weeks. Typically, we'll take those out and just clean them and uh, put those back in, uh, grease the bearings and the fittings that are up there on a monthly basis. But you're talking uh, a couple people, 30 to 45 minutes uh, once a week uh, to maintain the dryer. Differences in the two facilities that we're working with right now. We've got uh, hooks it that's feeding a hopper with 18% cake, uh, dewatering during manned hours and feeding the dryer throughout the night. Bellows Falls is directly feeding the slitter out of a PW Tech screw press um, and only working during manned hours. And that's going in at roughly 26%. Same machine, slightly different applications, uh, delivering the same 90% total solids on the end. Top three reasons to choose this Shinchi technology uh, first off would be cost savings. It's uh, competitively priced in the marketplace and it's extremely efficient to operate. Secondly would be the footprint. 
it's the smallest footprint on the market. Uh, the 4,800s that we're talking about here today, and they're seven feet, two inches wide, eight feet high, and 21 feet long. So a very small uh, footprint. And then lastly, um, they're simple to operate. They're um, really a neat technology that is dehumidifying more than uh, drying, and there is minimal operator involvement uh, during the day. We appreciate your time, and I'll turn it back over to Charlie. So thank you all for spending the time to learn a little bit more about the Shinchi technology, the belt drying technology that we are employing here at Bellows Falls in Hooksett, New Hampshire. Please stick around because we will be available to answer any questions. And once the COVID-19 situation stabilizes, as soon as it does in both New Hampshire and Vermont, we will be resuming actual physical tours of the drying technology.